morning. I welcome everyone to the 19th meeting of the Education Skills Committee in 2017. Can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? We've been considering a draft report for the last hour, and so we start the public part of the session with item two. We have a number of pieces of subordinate legislation to consider today, and we begin with the registration of independent schools, Shred Person Scotland Regulations 2017, which is a draft instrument subject to the affirmative procedure. Later in the meeting, we will consider the requirements for Teachers Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017, which cover similar ground, and there may be some discussion on that instrument during this item. I welcome to the meeting Shirley Ann Somerville, Minister for Further Education, Higher Education and Science, Shirley Anderson, Policy Officer, and Claire Cullen, Solicitor from the Scottish Government. I understand, Minister, that you would like to make a short statement. Yes, thank you, Convener. And thank you for the opportunity this morning to address the Committee in connection with the proposed introduction of a requirement that all teachers in independent schools must be registered with the General Teaching Council for Scotland. You will also be aware that it is our intention, as you said, to introduce legislation requiring that all teachers in grant-aided schools are GTCS registered by way of an amendment to the requirements for Teacher Scotland Regulations 2005, which you will be considering as a negative SSI under Item 4. A priority for the Scottish Government is to improve the life chances and education of all children in Scotland. High quality teaching and strong leadership are key features of a successful education system. By introducing a requirement for all teachers working in independent schools and grant-aided schools to be GTCS registered, this will bring them into line with local authority schools and is a means of improving the standard of teaching across the whole of the education sector. It will offer assurance to parents that, irrespective of where their children are educated, the standards and quality of teaching staff is regulated by the GTCS. The requirement will provide schools with assurances of the standard and the quality of the teachers they are employing. It will also benefit teachers through professional update, the aim of which is to support, maintain and enhance continued professionalism through professional learning. Section 98A5 of Part 5, the Education Scotland Act 1980, sets out the circumstances in which Scottish ministers shall not be satisfied in their consideration of an application to register an independent school. This includes that any teacher or proposed teacher is not a proper person if they are, by virtue of Part 5, disqualified from being a teacher, is disqualified from working with children, or a prescribed person. Section 98A6 of the 1980 Act provides for the Scottish Ministers to make regulations prescribing what a proper person should be. There is currently no requirement for teachers in independent schools to be GTCS registered, although this has been encouraged by both the GTCS and the Scottish Council of Independent Schools as an alternative to introducing regulations under Section 98A6 of the 1980 Act. Section 98A6 was inserted into the 1980 Act by the Schools Education Ministerial Powers and the Independent Schools Scotland Act 2004 with the policy intention of introducing compulsory GTCS registration for all teachers in independent schools, and this provision was commenced on the 31st of December 2005. The provision within the 1988 Act did not include a power to allow transitional arrangements when making regulations under Section 98A6, and therefore an amendment was brought forward through Section 26 of the Education Scotland Act 2016. This provision was commenced on the 1st of January 2017. In essence, this provided the mechanism with which we could ensure that existing non-GTCS registered teachers working in independent schools would remain in post. It was clear from early discussions with stakeholders that there were concerns about non-registered teachers working in independent schools and how the pro proposals would affect them. We have listened to those views and extended the proposed transition period in the regulations from our initial two-year period to three years, and believe this is sufficient given the progress it has been undertaken by GTCS in identifying alternative routes to registration, including the introduction of provisional and conditional registration. Individuals who achieve provisional or conditional registration would meet the proposed criteria within the draft regulations to be registered. While I'm aware that there are some reservations about some existing teachers achieving registration, we will continue to support the sector and the GTCS in moving forward. The committee will wish to note that transitional arrangements are not required for existing teachers in grant-aided schools, as the normal practice for those schools has been to only employ GTCS-registered teachers. 
The draft regulations in front of you today have therefore been drafted to define a prescribed person as any person who is not a registered teacher. A registered teacher means a teacher whose particulars are recorded in the register maintained by the General Teaching Council for Scotland. Indicate that from the 1st of October 2017, any teacher employed by an independent school must, be, it must not be a prescribed person. Provide a transitional period of three years until the 1st of October 2020 for registration to be achieved by current teachers working in schools at the point the regulations come into force. And set out arrangements for consideration of an application to register an independent school that has been submitted to Scottish ministers before 1st October 2017, but the decision has not been determined. A period of six months until the 1st of April 2018 has been provided for an application to be considered and if the registration is granted, any teacher or proposed teacher on the application form who is not GTCS registered will be given three years from the date of registration of the school to meet the GTCS standards. I therefore move the draft regulations are approved by the Education and Skills Committee this morning ahead of formal parliamentary approval. Thank you, Convener. Okay, I think you've jumped to go there, Minister, but thank you very much for that. This agenda item is intended for questions of clarification and the Minister and officials can answer questions under this item, and I, I will begin by asking the first question. The transitional period of three years for individuals employed in independent schools uh, before October this year is there. What's the rationale for the length of the transitional period, and is this enough time for individuals from across the independent sector to meet the requirements? I know that you uh, made some of those comments in, in your opening statement. Yes, um, we, we did listen during the, 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 the consultation process um, to, to some of the concerns within the sector about the, the time for that transitional period, which is why it's moved from two to, to three years. Um, and this will allow due time to, to allow every teacher um, to be able to, to receive um, the, the support from their school to, to become um, registered. And I think that um, shows that we've listened to the concerns within the sector um, and, and made the, the sufficient changes within the regulations. OK, thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions, Liz? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Can I just, uh, just declare my interest in uh, GTCS as a member? <coughs> but can I just say on the record that I think this is a very welcome move because um, I think it has a very considerable importance in improving the professionalism right across the board. May I ask two questions, Minister? Firstly, could you just confirm that this has no effect whatsoever by the impending changes to the GTCS? Uh, no, it, it, it does not. No, okay. we've, uh, the, the government's review will, will, will continue, but this um, process um, is, is in many ways separate to that. The policy um, proposal and, and the policy purpose that we have behind that will, will absolutely continue with the new arrangements in place. So, so any successor body would have... Absolutely. Uh, right. my, my second question relates more to the uh, costs, the potential costs for retraining, and I particularly refer to... Uh, special independent schools who are looking after some of our most vulnerable children and therefore have additional costs of that support. Um, is the expectation from the Scottish Government that these costs will fall on that independent school? I do appreciate that there are some concerns um, around the financial impact on some schools. Uh, I think the first thing to bear in mind is, is this has been um, an issue which they have been aware of for, for some time. Um, so I would have expected them to, to have um, plans in place and, and to be aware that, that this is something that has been um, in train. Um, but it is something which um, individual schools um, will, will have to, to look at. Um, the GTCS and the work that it's ongoing um, has been very supportive, um, I think, to the sector um, in ensuring, with, whether it's regards to the timelines or the different types of registration, uh, to attempt to work with the sector. And they'll continue to do that, but it's for the, the schools to, to move forward um, with those uh, provisions of, and for the teachers involved. So what would be the process if there was a school, and as a, I, I do particularly focus attention on those special schools, very small schools uh, that are independent, and obviously um, they sometimes find it very difficult to get staff. Um, if, if a school was in difficulty within that three-year period, what would you expect that school to do in terms of making an appeal? 
Well, there are ongoing uh, dialogues um, with the GTCS, um, which, as I say, have, I think, been very uh, supportive, and, um, and we would expect that to continue. There's a working group um, which is there to ensure that all this dialogue um, continues. That doesn't stop just because the regulations have came to Parliament um, today. So uh, they will be working with the sector uh, to ensure that all steps are taken to... to um, to um, ensure that there's, there's no difficulties for individual teachers. Obviously, when it comes down to registration, those decisions are quite rightly for the independent GTs, uh, GTS and not ministers, um, but they are uh, there to work collaboratively uh, with the sector to support them through working groups so that these individual issues, um, as they come to the fore, um, are worked through um, and done so in a way which uh, you know, we would expect uh, no school to be in, in any difficulty by the end of the transitional arrangements. OK, that's helpful. My, my last point is I, I, I raise the issue because of a small special school in my own area. Um, and you, as you know, the Scottish Government's intention is that level nine is a requirement for all those who are supporting uh, youngsters in, um, in, in these special schools. And there's a very considerable cost on that, not, not just for new teachers coming in, but for retraining existing staff. And I would ask the Scottish Government to be aware of that, because I think the cost for some of these small special schools is very considerable. I, I would certainly um, take that on board and, and would expect, I mean, both um, Scottish Government officials um, and, as, as I say, the um, GTCS um, will continue to work with the sector. I know there are very specific issues uh, which some um, schools on an individual basis have concerns over. Um, that's why I, I would stress to Liz Smith that that work is ongoing, that those discussions are, are still being had through working groups um, in a supportive manner uh, to ensure that um, those individuals aspects that need to be picked up uh, can be done so, can be recognised. Um, and we've seen um, the GTCS um, work with the sector um, um, to, I, I think, pr provide um, a number of categories for registration which deal with many of those individual concerns. Okay. There are still individual concerns out there, however, and that's why the work will continue with the sector um, to, to support them through that. Okay. Uh, may I just reference uh, correspondence I've had with uh, Mark Macdonald, the Minister, over this uh, in relation to um, a submission that was given to me by this school. Okay, thank you very much. Does anybody else have any other comments? Okay, in that case, can I thank you, Minister, and thank you, uh, Liz, for the questions. That concludes the evidence session in the registration of independent schools, prescribes Person Scotland, Regulations 2017. We now move on to item three, which is the formal debate on motion S5M6113 in the name of the Minister. I will remind everyone that officials are not permitted to contribute to the formal debate, and I ask the Minister to move the motion. Formally moved, Convener. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any contributions to make? No, okay. In that case, I will now put the question to the committee that motion S5M6113 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. The committee must report to Parliament on this instrument. Are members content for me as convener to sign off a report? Thank you. Can I then thank the Minister and her officials for their attendance? And I will now suspend for a moment before we move into the next item of business. Thank you.
Uh, the next item of business is consideration of three negative instruments which are listed on the agenda. Do members have comments on any of these instruments? Okay, thank you. In that case, we move on to the next item of business, item five, which is the second evidence session of the committee's inquiry into school infrastructure. This inquiry is focusing on the lessons to be learnt from the incident at Ox Gangs Primary School in January 2016. Last week, we heard from Professor Cole, representatives from the construction industry and head teachers. This week, we have we are hearing from local authorities, and I welcome to the meeting Peter Watton. Head of Property and Fa Facilities Management, City of Edinburgh Council. Alan White, Head of Property and Facilities Management, Aberdeenshire Council. Danny Lowe, Director of Housing and Technical Resources, South Lanarkshire Council. And Dave Aitken, Chair, Local Authority Building Standards Scotland. As I mentioned last week, it is important to note that there is an ongoing fatal accident inquiry relating to the accident at Liberton High School in 2014, when, very sadly, a pupil died following the collapse of a wall within the school. We will therefore avoid discussion on the specifics of that accident to ensure that this committee does not impinge on the work of the FAI by exploring matters which may be sub -judice. Before I bring in colleagues, I will kick off with a question. From a local authority point of view, how was it that schools have been built with serious defects in the brickwork and what lessons have been learnt? Would anybody particularly like to kick off? Yes, Danny. Thanks, convener. Uh, I to suggest that, the, you know, in terms of the evidence that's come through off the back of Professor Cole's um, report, it would seem to be that there's a, been a lack of quality assurance across a number of, of, of sites, which has led to that. So, uh, you know, almost a lack of supervision um, of um, certain trades within sites, which has led to errors, which have then been covered up and have only came to light a number of years later. Um, so I think the, you know, that's, that's a kind of fundamental issue can back into it, but clearly there's a number of other um, issues that are related to that too, which along the lines of um, you know, proper skills, availability of resources, um, proper skills um, being attributed to each of these individuals as well. So I think Professor Cole probably covers most of them within uh, his report, but that's kind of key issues that I would say from a local authority's perspective. Does anybody else have any other comments besides that? Because I'd like to come back with, with uh, another question. Peter Watton. Yeah, yeah you, you just leave it. Um, I think from Edinburgh's perspective, and, uh, and in particular the PPP1, it was clear that there, the fundamental issue was that there was a lack of responsibility in relation to quality assurance on behalf of the client. I think it's a lot more complicated than that. I think there's a, a cocktail of issues here that we have, uh, have to address. But fundamentally, 17 schools were built with defects. And we, as the authority where this happened, have thought and debated long and hard as to how this came about. We have analysed how it was procured, the PPP1, and indeed the relationships between the SPV and the council as client at that time. But the fundamental issue that is coming through is about quality assurance and ensuring that what you actually procure is actually what is being built on site. Mr. White, do you have any comment? I, I think it's a generalisation to, to state that schools have all defects, or because there's been large programmes of schools in, 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 with no evidence of uh, significant defects. Certainly, it is of concern if it's been established and if it's uh, been found from the, that PPP era of, of schools being constructed. Fundamentally, there seems to be a flaw between some of the detailing that was being designed at the time, how that information was then communicated to the, to the contractor, and how that work was actually undertaken on site. I think that that's, that's where we've got to learn the lessons from. Can, can, can I ask, um, you say that there was a, a lack of communication, uh, and we all say there's a lack of quality assurance, but surely any builder knows that when they're building that wall that those ties had to be in place, for example, which seemed to be the theme that was running through all Professor Cole's evidence last week. And I mean, it, it, it seems to me from, from here that what the local authorities did was they said, right, OK, this is your responsibility, you got on with it, and uh, we won't take any responsibility until such times as, as you had to. And surely, as, uh, as a local authority, 
it was your prime responsibility to make sure that the schools, that the ch children were going to be safe? Daniel. Thank you. Um, I, th I absolutely agree um, with that. that in terms of the contractual responsibility going through the PPP arrangements, then the transfer of risk generally um, goes with the contractor in terms of delivering the product that's been set out in the specification. Certainly from a South Lanarkshire Council perspective, um, then what we decided was to still take a hands-on approach to checking quality assurance throughout the PPP contract as well. So within that contract, there's a role for an independent certifier who is engaged um, by the various parties to the contract and who is there to, to check and certify. So there should be a scope or, uh, you know, certainly documentation as to what they're expected to carry out as part of that independent certification process. In South Lanarkshire, what we did was we overlaid the PPP contract with our own in-house team. Now, that in-house team also included a senior architect and a full-time clerk of works who were there to monitor quality assurance in the delivery of the PPP programme. Um, they then you know, carried out their own assessments on behalf of the council so that we could satisfy ourselves. So basically, in, you know, based on the size and the scope of our PPP project and also recognising and valuing the, the importance of getting these buildings to be built in the way in which we wanted to because they were going to be learning environments for the next 30 years. They needed to be fit for purpose um, you know, in terms of building and, and be a good creative learning environment for um, teaching and for kids to learn. And, um, so from that, we felt it was really important that we had a quality assurance process in place, which we did. Um, and, and we put that over and above that. So I think it was just a clarification I was trying to make sure that not all authorities tackled this in the same way. Some took a slightly different approach. Well, I suppose the question that, that, that leads from your answer is, if South Lanarkshire were doing that, why wasn't everybody doing that? Peter Lawton. I think um, it might be useful if I explain the difference between the Council's PPP1 and PPP2 <coughs> contracts because we find no issues with PP2. So what was the difference between the two? And the fundamental difference was, um, as Dan has just explained, our in-house resource, our technical team, our architects, our project managers, etc., were not involved in PPP1. In except, PP except that they were in South Lancaster's cases. Yes, exactly. In PPP2, Edinburgh, they were. They were policing what was happening on the ground and indeed in the project team. Yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of, sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt you here, but I'm, I'm kind of at a loss as to why uh, they weren't involved at PPP1 because there clearly was a best practice there where there was a sort of overlay of scrutiny in South Lanarkshire and I suspect one or two other councils, but not in all councils. And I mean, I, get, I go back to this whole responsibility and it's the local authority's responsibility to make sure those schools were safe. And there seems to have been a, a, a huge abrogation of that responsibility in certain local authorities. Mr White, you wanted to come in? Yes. I, I think we look at it, it's, it's the timing of, of these constructions. And, and again, probably South Lanarkshire, I may be wrong with the benefit, they, they came in later on to the, the, the PPP programme. Maybe. It, um, in terms of Aberdeenshire, what, what we've done, certainly with our more recent similar type developments, we have got full, full inspection shadow, shadow teams. And, and that was in place before the, the, the evidence of, of, of Edinburgh, the defence of Edinburgh. And, and that was, I can remember having that debate with my own team and, and, and having to be convinced this is why we got a clerk works inspection when we've got a competent contractor and competent design teams. They should be quality assured, quality control. We don't need this. They convinced me we still need it. And we, and we went forward on that basis. And the evidence was that we've, we had no defects at the school in, in, in question at the Tafford. At that year at the time, and, and I was at Aberdeen, so I went through Aberdeen, she came back, I was in the periphery of that PPP process. It was a whole new concept. And the property teams in particular, we were light touch around about it. And that was a concept where we'd been sold this model of risk transfer to a provider, and they would undertake this works. And, and our involvement was overseeing some of the design aspects, just in general aesthetics and whatever, some of the room data sheets. Primarily led by education and legal services, because a lot of it in financial, because a lot of the, the thinking was more it was a financial services delivery as opposed to a construction delivery. Mm -hmm. And it almost the construction professionalism was out of favour at, at that time in, in terms of the, the council's input. Now, in hindsight, that is generally prone to be remiss, but at that time, it did not seem inconceivable that that was the right approach. Yeah. I'm going to let some of my colleagues in. I just think that the. I, I, 
uh, and I accept what you say because I remember got that period and, and all the, the first round about the PPIs, uh, contracts and stuff like that, but it comes back to the fact that the safety of schools is a local authority responsibility. I would have thought that the local authority would have made sure, particularly as it was a brand new type of project, that they were comfortable with the way it was getting done in the early stages. But at this stage, I'll bring in Liz and then Daniel. Uh, yes, thank you, convener. Um, can I just take you back to the uh, evidence that uh, Jim Thewlis uh, provided us with uh, last week when he says that, and I quote, I feel quite scared about what's uh, been happening. Head teachers take over school buildings on the basis that they trust that they're fit for purpose. And he highlights in Professor Cole's report uh, this missing link between the contractor and the client. And he said that, you know, for a client, read head teacher. Could I ask the local authority representatives, what has to be done to improve that link between uh, local authorities and the head teachers? From Edna's point of view, for some time, the head teacher is part of the project board. So on site at the minute, we have a new Burramur High School. The head, new, the head teacher is part of the decision-making process about the construction of that, that school. That was the same with Portobello. Uh, and James Gillespie's. So there is a lot more involvement of the head teachers in the decisions around the actual construction of the actual project. I think, obviously, f from a head teacher's perspective, um, they may be comfortable sitting on these panels, but I don't think they're comfortable at all in the sense that they're obviously not trained in um, building requirements and, and to be able to have knowledge about what is a good and a bad design. And that, that was point a point put very forcibly actually by one of the other witnesses last week that there is there is a gap in some of the uh, knowledge even within the building contractors that you know we're not necessarily getting the quality that we should now that's a different issue in, in one respect but i feel um that the head teachers have got a very powerful point in this that they are almost in a position of responsibility yet they cannot be expected surely to have all the necessary uh, knowledge to be able to know what is a good and a bad design. That's the question that I think Jim Thulis was asking, and I think we need to address that. And I, I'm very interested in what local authorities feel they can do to give head teachers some security um, in, in all of this. Thank you, convener. Um, from a South Lancashire perspective, again, the schools weren't individually involved in influencing the contractual arrangements. At the end of the day, that's why the council has got property um, sections and, and people to set up contracts. There are designers to take that forward. What we did engage with every school that was constructed throughout the programme was with the head teachers and what makes a good learning environment. So again, going back in here about you know what's the best use of space within the the, 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 the school area itself. How would, how should classrooms be laid out? Not particularly about the size of classrooms and bricks and blocks and what a roof should look like and picking it back up and the actual design of the property and, and, and the, the kind of structural implications of that. But what would make it a good teaching environment? So how should classes be laid out? How, what, how, what would the flow of the school be or what should it be in, in order to, to make it a good learning environment as well, you know, for, for now and for future needs? Um, having a look at the, you know, the teachers were involved in the, the colour schemes that were picked, how the school was going to look good and bright and vibrant. They were involved in the interior design at the end. They were involved in setting the logos, um, how that would look in the school. But taking a step back from that again, um, once they were then involved in that process, then we have a conduit in South Lancashire through a, a, a school's modernisation team. And that, that team is the conduit between the actual designers and, and the, the property constructors and the managers and the actual head teachers themselves. So when we got a design ready for a school based on our initial discussions with the, the, the modernisation team with the head teachers, that design was then taken and presented to the head teacher for comment. Um, took it to the head teacher, commented on and amended it if appropriate. It would then come back, it would then go to the parent teachers association for the school, um, who would then get a chance to view that, get a chance to look at the, the design of the school, the layout, how it was going to look and feel. Mm -hmm. And thereafter what we arranged was a roadshow within the school itself for the wider community to come along, have a, a view, have a look at the proposals. And then at the end of the day, when the, when the project progressed and when it was constructed, there was no surprises in terms of what was getting built and it was there. So in, in, in terms of going back to it, you know, we weren't looking for the head teacher to design structural defects or uh, structural um, 
requirements of the school or you know what the materials that you should, should use, but instead it was more about layouts and flow and generally making a good teaching environment. But Mr Lowe, I, I accept all that and I think it's very important that the head teacher and staff and uh, parents are involved in making suggestions about that. But Mr Thewlis's point is that about the responsibility. I mean, he made that very powerful assertion that if every parent wants to know that when they send their child off to school uh, each day that it's safe. And his, his concern just now, on behalf of head teachers, is that the, uh, the, the structure of the ability to make a contract and oversee that contract properly is not sufficiently robust, and therefore the head teacher is left in a, a, a bit of limbo as to, to be able to say who is finally responsible for the safety of this building. That's the point Mr Thewlis is rightly making. And my point, which follows on from what the convener was saying, is that it, it is somebody's responsibility to ensure that there is safety in the school. And I'd be very interested to know how you think that we can improve this so that all local authorities can give a categorical assurance that the right processes uh, are in place to ensure and guarantee that safety. Yeah. Um, so I think probably just to try and cover that briefly then, in, in terms of our two arrangements, then we've got the secondary schools that were built under a PPP arrangement, and clearly the, the PPP provider has, has got a requirement then to keep the schools to the desired standard. It's important, though, that the council retain an overview of that to make sure that that standard has been adhered to, um, because effectively we are delivering a service from those properties. Um, and secondly, in terms of this, the primary school estate in South Lanarkshire, which is council-owned um, and, and built, um, then we actively monitor um, repairs, maintenance, we do cyclical inspections and we monitor the, the condition of that property um, in association with the schools, but effectively that comes back and it's for the property section to make sure that, that school is maintained to the, the correct standard. Thank you, Kameen. I mean, first of all, just uh, as I did last week, just like to highlight the fact that obviously this is an issue that, that significantly impacted my constituency in, in Edinburgh Southern. Uh, Ox Gangs is just outside, but also a number of schools were impacted in my constituency. I think you've already mentioned the quality assurance point, but the other point that Professor Cole makes very clear is that the, the, it's the nature of the contract, uh, the, the packaging up of the design and construction elements, uh, uh, which can happen in a, in a number of different models, uh, is the, the key issue. I was just wondering if, if particular Peter Watton could just reflect on the, the, the steps that have been taken since Professor Cole's report. Um, and if there are other comments from other panellists, I'd, I'd be interested to know, and specifically around the quality assurance point, to make sure that things are made, built to spec, and also that are safe. Okay. Uh, a report will be submitted to Edinburgh Council next Thursday on the Council's full response to the Cole report. I will send it to the clerks on Friday once it becomes public for your information. It's over 100 pages long in terms of the response, but the response has started. We are carrying out intrusive surveys on all existing buildings based on uh, a proportionate risk-based approach, starting with those at highest risk, risk which is post-1995 uh, construction. Um, that information and our approach is detailed in Appendix 1 uh, to submission to this uh, committee. All PPP1 and PPP2 have been remediated and fire stopping issues have been uh, addressed and will be further addressed during the summer break. All council properties are currently undergoing a condition survey and as part of that condition survey, fire specialist surveys will be carried out as an additional appendix. Um, I think it's, it's fair to say that since actually PPP1, our approach to quality assurance has increased significantly. As a result of the COAL report, it will again increase significantly. We have engaged with our main supplier, um, Hubco Southeast, and agreed with them a series of measures taken into the account of the COAL recommendations, which again is attached as Appendix 2 in my submission to this, uh, to this committee. I think the, the fundamental issue, obviously, in relation to PPP1 was the lack of quality assurance. 
we will now have Clarker Works on all in have Clarker Works on all in flight construction projects and we'll have them on all construction projects moving forward. I do, however, think that it would be wrong to say that having the Clarker Works on site is the answer to all the problems. It does, however, mitigate risk in terms of a direct relationship with the client about what is actually happening on the site, i.e. what you procured is actually what is being delivered, particularly in relation to those elements of the build building that are not visible once it is constructed. Um, so moving forward, we have significantly increased our capacity in terms of in-house resource professionalism. And I think most importantly, and speaking to my colleagues before we come in here today, the decisions relating to PPP1, the senior responsible officers were education officers. The decisions relating to the capital, how the capital was spent and how the project delivered was delivered within that envelope. At that time, the private sector, as we've heard, was the case. Leave it to us. We're the experts. We'll deliver it for you. Clearly, something went wrong, uh, particularly in relation to the masonry elements of those 17 buildings. So we have learned a lesson. We're now moving to what we term as a corporate landlord approach. That means that the property professionals will deliver the building and maintain it through its life cycle so that decisions that are being made relating to capital cost of construction take into account the life cycle cost of the asset vis-a-vis -vis the revenue cost per annum in relation to what you're actually building. That is what the industry requires and what actually should be happening. So I hope some of those elements um, give you some comfort in relation to how we're moving forward, in particular relation to those projects that are on site and are due to come on site. So can I just ask one point of clarification on that? I mean, one of the points Professor Gore raised was, was that because design and build had been essentially put together in one contract under, whether it's PPP or design yeah. build, that, that, that there's a lack of transparency around the design elements and, and, uh, and the, some of the detail around that. Is that a point that, that, that you have either addressed or, or are seeking to address? Speaking, we're certainly speaking to address. Um, the problem is with design and build, at some point you innovate the design over to the actual contractor. Yeah. And then from that point on, the designer and the project team are working to the contractor. And I suppose the challenge is, how do you retain the benefits of DBFM and design and build and still get the quality assurance, direct quality insurance as the client, I think that is the issue that needs to be addressed. With PPP at that time, I think it's a very important point for a committee to understand that the contractor, as part of that consortium, had an investment in the, the vehicle that was delivering the schools. Now, typically what happens his return will be shares in that company. What he has created, created is a commodity to be sold as an investment. Typically, the first party to exit, i.e. sell their shares, will be the contractor. What the investment market is buying is not, they don't look at it as 17 schools. They look at it as the right to receive a revenue return from a local authority for a period of 30 years. It's an investment. So you kind of, from that perspective, the contractor typically would exit quite early in the SPB. Now, if you've heard from the Cole report, the shares in PPP1 have been sold several times over the years to different investors. I mean, are there any other sort of reflections from other panel members about the implications of the Cole report and any changes? I don't know if there's any. Form the, the, the witnesses that you don't need to press upon. That gets done for you. Okay. Super, thank you. It's getting very confusing for <laughs> our committee. You've got to press a button. You're more and more here in Edinburgh. Um, thank you for that. I th think 
I'll, I'll give an example. I was at one of our uh, schools being constructed last week, UDC School in, in Inverurie, and it was, it was reassuring for myself just to see the practice being adopted by the contractor. And I, there are a few ingredients to ensure that a successful project. One is ensuring we've got the right contractor. Mm -hmm. And in Aberdeenshire, our approach is we go through a framework whereby we pre-qualify pre the contractors to make sure it's the right contractor is there. Um, also, in terms of ensuring we've got the right designers as well, uh, is, is, is so important, so with a quality assurance by the contractor and quality control on site as well. What I, what I witnessed last week at Tinvaruri was effective quality control. The contractor, uh, a very effective site manager, had taking photographic evidence of all the cavity walls, the wall ties, the wall head restraints. All the, uh, the tradespersons on site had to sign off they'd undertaken the work and did that. The site was immaculate, the quality was first class. It was Morrison Construction carrying out the work. And again, I would contend a good contractor before, but certainly learned the lessons, are listening to what's been established from the coal inquiry are uh, taking that through to their own tradespersons. And I was speaking to the contractor today, Robertson's, who was our PPE contractor. They are actually putting in place the training of their, their bricklayers, the findings of the coal report, just to ensure they actually recognise the significance and the importance of quality of um, their work and the importance of safety. So certainly, I think the, the, there is a spotlight on construction right now, and the industry is, is uh, reacting to that. Certainly from our own perspective as well, there's just that awareness we would contend with the schools that we've constructed uh, more recently, with no defects being found. Also schools delivered through a traditional method, the same thing in the PPP era, no defects were found there, but we can get complacent. But just that additional quality checks and quality assurance checks are in place. So, last uh, question. One final question. So, I, mean, I think one of the most concerning uh, conclusions that the Professor Cole put in front of us was that as a result of this that, he, he, that there were almost certainly a number of undetected faults in buildings across Scotland and we just don't know what those are. And I guess this is really a question for, for Dave Aitken, but is that a conclusion that, 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 that you would concur with? And, 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 and is there any way that we can sort of scale uh, and, and size that issue? I don't think I'm in a position to answer that in, in terms of uh, you know, scaling and size and that issue. Um, in terms of the, the core report, what it has done is, is highlighted the, the misconception of the role of building standards in the, in the construction process. I think that, that's uh, certainly been highlighted. Um, from a local authority uh, building standards uh, point of view, you know, in, in terms of the lessons learned, uh, um, I'm aware that the Building Standards Division, the Scottish Government, is currently reviewing the, um, the inspection regime that's, that's, uh, that's in place uh, within the, the, the legislation just now, um, and labs will be involved in that. You know, so so uh, I think it's been hinted on earlier that, um, and it runs right through the core report, that, that you know the, there's no silver bullet solution here. It has to be a holistic approach, a collective approach. Um, and everyone has their, their, their part to play as, as building standards will uh, through inspections. Um, as an organisation, labs are organising a, a, an industry event in, in August uh, where we're uh, bringing in, um, sorry, we've invited uh, all uh, key stakeholders, project managers, architects, engineers, colleges, the universities to come together as a collective group and we're going to use coal as a backdrop uh, just to see, you know, what, how um, how we can move forward with this and um, assist the government with their uh, research as well. Okay. For, forgive me, but just on the, the very specific point about undetected issues, I mean, I, uh, is that a conclusion that you agree with? Uh, well, yeah, I, I would, I would. Uh, it'd be hard for me to, to, to pass judgment on that because building standards are only required to, to carry out reasonable inquiry. Yeah. Can I ask, just further to that then, um, was there an over-reliance on building standards? I think that runs through the, the misconception. There's a misconception that runs through the coal report on the role of building standards. Okay, right, thank you very much. Uh, Gillian, you want to come out as well? Yeah, um, I have to declare an interest, uh, particularly interested in asking Alan White some questions around the uh, Aberdeenshire schools. Um, one of the PP three schools, uh, my interest is my daughter goes to one. And obviously I have an interest in the schools there. 
I would like you to give me assurance as what was done when the issues with the Edinburgh schools were identified, what Aberdeenshire Council did to inspect the schools that were, um, were built under the same scheme for parents like myself. Okay. I'll just get the information here. It was included in the submission. Um, when the ir ir issue arose in 2016, uh, we carried out a desktop assessment initially uh, to, to, to identify this, this, the schools that we'd built in that era, which included the PPP schools. We immediately carried out, well, so we, we soon thereafter carried out a visual survey of all the schools. And they didn't indicate anything major of major significance um, and we used uh, scan devices, borescopes, uh, to, to, to look at the presence and location of wallhead, uh, wall ties and, and, and wallhead restraints. Um, however, we, we, we changed that and targeted an intrusive surface, and we undertook that uh, late autumn last year. And that identified some issues that need to be rectified in terms of there is an absence of head restraints at, at some of the uh, structural frames and some uh, localised inadequate embedment of wall ties. Some at Edinburgh, but not on the series of scale in Edinburgh. So we certainly, to answer your question, we certainly moved forward with a programme of the desktop exercise. We then did visual surveys by and pointed our consultant engineer, independent engineer, first to do that. We were, just as an additional reassurance, we did the intrusive surveys. Once we did the intrusive surveys, we established that there was some localised issues and they need to be remedied. In terms of moving forward, how we're, how we're doing that, which is all important, is there is um, commitment by the PPP contractor, Robertson uh, Education Aberdeen, that they will rectify the defects. They have given that commitment and they'll rectify it at, at the cost uh, to themselves. Uh, as recently as this morning, I spoke to Robertson's and they gave me a commitment. They are geared up to undertake this work during the summer period. Where we're at just now, we've got a slight debate between the engineers in terms of the scale of the work to be carried out the wallhead restraints. More in view is, don't take any risks on this, undertake the work. And that, that is, and I give them firm advice on that. We need to undertake it in that regard. Um, to provide some reassurance, both our independent engineers and the, the, uh, the PPP Project Co have stated there is no immediate risk to the occupants of that building. Slums to yourself, I've got a son at one of the schools who goes to Van Prime. The Van mm. Prime is one of the schools involved as well. Um, so in that in that regard, we were reassured by the, the, the contractor because certainly the safeguard our pupils is an uh, ultimate concern. We are looking to carry out that programme during the summer holiday period. In addition, and, and not just directly as a result of the, the core report, um, but as a result of the ongoing concern about some of the fire stopping issues, we had a, in working conjunction with the Project Co, had got a fire risk assessment carried out and identified a number of issues with regard to fire stopping at the PPP2 schools. And I, and I can assure you that these were a significant number of issues and the works to them to those schools was undertaken in April this year. Right. And with regard to the processes that you had when the PPP schools were being built in Aberdeenshire, um, did you, I mean, obviously the coal uh, Professor Cole's evidence was really centred on not having a clerk of works uh, present in the Edinburgh schools. Was that the case in Aberdeenshire? We, we had no clerk of works involved. We, we, as I said, we were in the periphery. I used to manage the clerk of works at that time, and we were never requested to be involved. And, and at that time, it had identified no requirement to be involved because of the model it was being delivered. And how has that changed going forward? We, we've got clerk works now. We've, across Aberdeenshire, we have got 20, we term those problem inspectors, 20 problem inspectors, which is probably more than most authorities in Scotland. Um, we will retain that resource, and they are on all our capital projects and on the maintenance projects as well. Okay. And also, when we did the similar model for the DBFM through Hubco, we had independent clerk works on that as well. I would add, in terms of clerk works, is it's all about quality inspections by qualified Clarker works, and there's a bit of work to be done. I think by all authorities there, there's a ticking time bomb in terms of the age profile of Clarker works and attracting people into the Clarker industry. So it's certainly something we are looking at as an authority, mm -hmm. and certainly something we need to identify the training for Clarker works. There was another issue mentioned as well um, in last week's evidence about the the standard of training that was taking place for people actually bricklayers. 
yeah. um, and sub, sub, subcontracting, people not being aware of who it was on site, what qualifications they had, what stands. How, how did, was that addressed or how was that managed by Aberdeenshire? In terms of that, I could say a couple of things there. Um, there is a, a concern about the number of people going into the industry. And if I would say uh, the last year's intake of, of bricklayers across Aberdeen, across Grampian, there, there are 12, and that, that number is far too low. We've, we've got a piece of work in Aberdeen to develop a young workforce, which all authorities will be taking forward. What we've identified is a need to get people into the construction sector. So we're working with education, HR, some of the major contractors to organise a workshop and seminar, how we can take that forward, because we don't think the existing practices are sufficient. So certainly that, that is one aspect. <coughs> Again, speaking to the industry, they are doing additional training. And I, I, I mentioned earlier on, Robertson's providing a, a, a video to train their, their apprentices and just to reinforce the message. But and certainly, I think contractually, that there is, there's always a contractual, there's a right for us to, to inspect it, the contractors have got the qualifications to, to, to perform on site. But I think, I to undertake the work on site, I think there's probably something more we could do contractually just to provide reassurance at the, the individuals carrying out the work on site are qualified and have the skills done to take the tasks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Claire and, and then Ross. Convener, uh, um, and thank you to the panel for coming along this morning. I'd like to pick up on, on uh, some themes that, that I explored last week with the, with the panel and I've got some, some sort of so quite specific questions. So I'd like, I'd like to hear whether um, you feel that the inspection activity in relation to the specific problems identified in Edinburgh is considered to be adequate in your local authority areas. And I'm particularly keen to hear from South Lanarkshire, this obviously uh, Mr Lowe's authority covers my constituency. Okay, yeah. okay thanks. Um, Thanks. There's a number of actions we've undertaken uh, since the, the coal report was re reported and indeed since the, the incident at Oxgangs happened. In terms of our secondary school estate, then we had Fairhurst consulting engineers carrying out intrusive surveys to three schools. So in terms of the PPP contract, we had three phases of works. So we selected a school from each of the individual phases and that spanned the two contractors who worked on that programme for us. Um, the Fairhurst then did a walk around of the site to identify walls which they would want to carry out an intrusive survey on, and they also checked the as-built drones. Following on from that, they, they did the intrusive survey and came back and, and confirmed that the walls were built as they should be and they were stable, so that there was no, no issues in relation to that. There was minimum repairs noted as a result of that, and they were carried out with no disruption to the school. Uh, in terms of the primary school estate, then we did a visual inspection of the whole estate. I think it was last April, and we, we had a walk around survey. And we then selected five primary schools for intrusive survey, which was five different contractors had worked. Or, sorry, it was, was a selection from the five different contractors that had worked across the programme. We also did desktop audits and checks with the designers who had worked in the programme to confirm that the same wall detail that had been used in Edinburgh wasn't used in any South Lancashire schools. And that was confirmed that that was the case, and we got assurances back in relation to that. We checked our project records too. We did have Clark Works engaged in every uh, project that we carried out, and whose job was when they were on site to monitor the quality of work that was getting carried out, adherence with specification as well, and checking standards. So we could go back into our project records, and in many cases in those project records, we had photographic evidence, um, for example, of the, the external walls as they were built which showed the presence of wall ties, showed the spacings of wall ties, and you could see the embedment as well. So rather than having to go back and do further intrusive surveys, then from the desktop exercise, we could actually start to see that and it started to build that picture too. Again, there was only minor repair works issued, uh, noted as, as part of the intrusive survey and the visual um, survey. Um, again, these were carried out with no disruption at the schools. Uh, we have an annual cyclic inspection too of all properties within South Lancashire, not just schools. And that's carried out by our in-house team of building surveyors who look way beyond the, the, the number of elements that was picked up in the coal report. So they will you know, do a whole condition assessment of the school because we would use that in terms of um, reporting information that came back to the government in terms of property condition. Um, and we also use that in terms of our life cycle maintenance and having a look at our capital programmes going forward so that we can properly plan future investment requirements. So these annual inspections last year had completed at the end of March. We went back and we checked the records in relation to them to see if any issues had been picked up as that. And again, that gave us a reassurance that everything was, was in place as it should be. 
Um, in terms fire, of, fire, yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask in terms of the other local authorities, because I don't want to even seem South Lancashire centric. You, uh, uh, you know, I, if you could maybe comment on, on the issues that I've raised. Yeah. Um, and yes. Stop we, the <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we're carrying out intrusive surveys. As a result of that, we've identified five properties that have similar issues. Um, not identical, it's not to the same extent. It's mostly, for example, in a panel there should be, uh, let's say, 100 wall ties, and, and, and there's only 80. But we've adopted a very risk averse approach, as I'm sure you could appreciate, mm -hmm. and um, we are remediating in those uh, circumstances. Okay, thank you. Mr. White? Yep. Um, we, it's, it's similar to the others um, in, in, in terms of uh, we've done all the work on the, the, the existing PPP and the, the similar type projects and the quality assurance aspects. But moving forward, what, what's our going fo focus will be on our existing assets and we're developing a survey programme for that at present. There is also a piece of work we're doing nationally, uh, so there is a consistent approach in how we assess problems for condition and suitability, and that's been carried out with the Scottish Government, the Scottish Future Trust and the, the associated directors are involved in that as well. So we, we, are, we are inputting to, to that as a council and uh, j just to, to provide the reassurance. But there has always been a monitoring regime as in a, kind of the checks on building and whatever. What we're moving forward towards now is a more intense condition survey uh, approach. Okay. Thank you. And can I ask one very, just to, to go back, it was something that Mr. Wharton had had said in, in a reply to Daniel Johnson's question about uh, financing, and you were talking about how um, the uh, the asset gets sold on by the original contractor. If you knew that, why then was this particular contract or this particular finance deal used? That's the same for every PPP contract or um, B, uh, DBFM. It's the ultimate owners of it. Or, or shares in the company that are tradable. Um, so it's not an isolated, uh, it's not isolated the Edinburgh's PPP1, it's, it's the same with the mall, so it's effectively a commodity, and that commodity is the right to receive a, a revenue income from a local authority covenant. It's, it was my impression from how you'd answered that, that it was, uh, that, it, that you, um, hadn't foreseen that, so I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, sorry about that. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Convener. Very much following on from Claire Hoy's original questions on inspections, but I'd just like to check with Mr Watton first to understand the, the process of what happened at Ox Gangs. Um, my understanding is that after the initial incident there, a visual inspection was carried out of both Ox Gangs and 16 other uh, schools. Uh, further to the visual inspection, the school was reopened, but after the intrusive inspection, it was then closed for, for a longer period of time. Was the further intrusive inspection, was that um, automatically triggered? Uh, is that an automatic process following an incident like that? Or was the decision only taken to do an intrusive inspection after the visual inspection had been carried out? It was the latter. Um, ESP, the provider, had carried out uh, visual inspections and did not identify any issues. Obviously, the wall that fell down had to be repaired, um, and a method statement of how that was going to take place. As uh, an additional precaution, an intrusive investigation was done by ESP to uh, look at the rest of the walls in Ox Gangs. It was at that point that they came in to our offices and basically told us that they could not guarantee the safety of the children, not only in Ox Gangs, but the other 16 properties. And that obviously left us in a position with uh, very little choice, but they closed the other facilities and proceed with additional intrusive surveys and ultimately remedial works. I'd be interested in everyone's thoughts on this. My feeling is that should an incident like that not automatically trigger the need for intrusive inspection? Is there an issue of, of process here, that there needs to be a much more stringent, clearer process on what happens in the aftermath of incidents like this, so that you don't have, as was the case here, of a school reopening before closing again? 
I think it would be virtually impossible within a contract in that context to cover for every eventuality. What happens is because we lost possession of the school, then ESP lost the right to the unitary charge um, in respect of what the council was paying them. So ideally you would want to cover every situation, but I think in practice it would be impossible. Interested in anyone else's thoughts on, on this process of, in, in your local authorities after uh, this incident, was the immediate decision taken to move to intrusive inspections? I know, Mr White, you discussed this with, with Jillian Martin a moment ago. Is it best practice in your authority, is it part of a, an agreed process in your authority to move to intrusive inspections, or is it only once visual inspections have been carried out, a decision is then taken whether or not to move to something more intrusive? That from again from a South Lancashire perspective, then we took the, the view in terms of the secondary school estate just to move straight to intrusive, uh, intrusive surveys, and for the primary schools, then clearly we weren't going to carry out intrusive surveys of 121 primary schools. So it, it was an element of carry out a visual ins inspection quickly to determine whether there's anything that was apparent. But knowing that that isn't going to show hidden faults, um, we then backed it up with intrusive surveys. So. Generally, we would always have an intrusive survey as part of um, a, 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 an, our approach to looking into issues such as this. That seems like best practice in an in instance like this. Thank you. Can, can I just clarify, Mr. Lord, did you say earlier on that you did a sample of uh, the primary schools? We did a sample of uh, one from each. One, one, one from yeah. yeah. We, we, there was we, we picked five schools which had been carried out by five different contractors and we, we surveyed them in terms of the primary schools. And in the secondary school estate, we did a sample survey of three secondary schools, yeah. which were through the different phases of the contract. Yes, uh, Mr Aitken, have you got any comment to make on that? I have no comment to make on that, no. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ruth? Um, good morning, panel. Um, we've heard evidence that the crux of the matter is really that nobody was taking responsibility on behalf of the client. Um, and that perhaps misguidedly stepping back to avoid risk. Um, I'd be interested to hear the panel's reflections on um, whether in sort of seeking to transfer the risk away from the public sector, that those who are procuring these projects are just too detached from the detail of them. So do you have any comment? Mr. Lowe. I was yeah, sorry. I was just going to say that that is not something that that we did in South Lanarkshire. We decided to be um, you know, very hands-on in relation to quality assurance um, throughout our PPP contracts and throughout our primary school program that we carried out internally. Then we did engage a clerk. Uh, and why us. did you do that? Uh, well, I think I, I probably just, you know mm -hmm. tried to explain that in one of my answers earlier as well. The, the, you know, in terms of the size and scope of this program and the importance um, of it to the council and what it was going to be delivering on our behalf, then there is an element where if you become detached with that, you know, have, what sort of controls have you got? Are, are, are you got adequate controls in place? And I think from our perspective, then we felt the importance of these programs and their delivery, then it merited us being um, very much as hands-on as we could be, sorry, in that programme to ensure that we were getting the specification of the property that we were seeking to get as part of these programmes. And so would you say that that more um, hands-on approach and that, that element of, of scrutiny um, in itself assures a better quality of, of construction? I suppose it, it's got an added layer um, in, in terms of quality construction going back, but I mean, I think, I suppose fundamentally going back to issues in construction, it is much wider about errors, and the, which isn't really tied solely to a particular um, group of property. So it's not all about schools, it's not all about PPP contracts, and it's not about any contract type, it's about errors across the construction industry and how you resolve these errors. Um, they're, they're probably two or three different things you can do in relation to that. We can employ armies of checkers to go in and you know, just constantly check every work person to make sure they're doing everything they, they should be doing. Or alternatively, it is that bit about going back into the construction industry itself 
and trying to change that and change attitudes and change behaviours. So it, it, it becomes part of a, a kind of wider industry issue to say that how collectively can we improve quality in construction, which isn't necessarily always about putting more people um, at the back end doing the checking. It's about encouraging contractors from the top down to have a, a, a process of thinking, you know, we, you know, we want to improve quality standards. We don't want to be handing over um, projects at the end that have got defects. Um, that then filters down from the top level of contractors all the way down to the, the bricklayers and say it, it goes back into the, the quality standards of um, their training. Um, you know, when, when, when they get their certification to start with, but how do you keep that up to date? Construction methods change. I think my colleague change. is going to come in a bit on skills and training so shortly. So you, uh, you would acknowledge that that independent scrutiny and, re and removing the slight conflict of interest in terms of quality assurance is important, though. We, certainly in South Lancashire, we felt it was important, and that's why we, we put those those checks in in every contract. A point that uh, I think it might have been Mr. White that said earlier on that you came into the process later. Would would that have um, sort of guided your decision to be more hands-on, <coughs> or would it just be the culture that you, you think that you had there? involved in that at the time, but I would suggest that that is the culture that, that we had within the organisation, because um, whilst we came into the kind of PPP arrangement, I think we signed about 2006, which was a period, didn't it? but by that time, you know, many of the folks we're, talking, we're speaking about today are, are much later than that, so these things wouldn't have been apparent at that point in time. But yeah. okay. Okay. Does anybody else have any comments to make on Ruth McGuire's point? Just a very brief run, and it's about transfer of risk. Um, in my experience and what we've been through with the PPP1, you can transfer all the risk you want, but you'll never actually in practice be able to transfer reputational risk. Thank you. Mr. White? It, it was just, just an aspect is, uh, whilst the authorities who didn't have employed back works, there was an independent certifier, and again, the perception at the time the independent certifier was carrying out that role on behalf of the, 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 the client as, a, as, in, as in working uh, between the contractor and, and the client to ensure the works were carried out to the right standard. What history has told us that, that they were only on site for one and a half days a month and would certainly never have the, the capacity to, to, to check everything. The thing fundamentally as well is Clarker Works is not the panacea. We've got to get it through. It's got to be constructed correctly. It's got to be designed correctly. It's got to be constructed correctly as well. So it's the Clark Works will solve part of the issue. But there's other strands of activity we need to resolve as well. Yeah, I, th I think the, the word the magic bullet's not it's been used a few times, and there never is one. So I think everybody recognises your clerk of work wouldn't be one either. Call. Thank you, Vera. Um, clearly, our main concern here is to ensure that present and future schools and other public buildings are going to be safe. Is the procurement process itself flawed? And if so, what has to be done to change it? Yeah, interesting one in, in, in terms of, of how we move forward with the procurement. We've got to work within the, the, the procurement rules. And um, if you're in the private sector, you can, you can select who you want to turn the day work. In the public sector, we're quite rightly open to competition. It's got to be transparent uh, and integrity to the process. And, and, and that's an absolute given. Where that sometimes leads to is that you don't always get the contractor that you would generally want to have on a construction project. So you, you need, on that basis, you need to ensure that you have an effective procurement strategy. How we look to that in Aberdeenshire as pre-select through a framework. So you ensure that you're only getting contractors done to take the work. It's been tried and tested and had successful outcomes. So I, th I think in that context, and I wouldn't say it's a procurement issue in terms of what was Kind of what, what we're seeing in, in the industry for the defects industry, we've got to ensure as construction professionals that we work with the procurement service and work within the legislation to ensure we get the right outcomes. Is it then the contract process that's flawed? In, in terms of the, there are different ways of, of undertaking it, and I would think in, in all this year, been doing construction for a long time, and we probably changed in our thinking of what's the right approach. So was, we, were, we were certainly encouraged to go down a design and, bid, a design and build model to transfer risk and, and, and ensure uh, so a control, a control of cost and, and whatever. I know in Aberdeenshire, we, we're now minded towards back to our traditional model where we retain most control, and, and, and that's the approach we're taking in most of our larger construction projects now. Is that the path that other local authorities have 
going down now? Um, yes. Um, back to more traditional approach, but also uh, working with um, our HUBCO in relation to addressing the issues. Um, I don't think procurement, procurement is the issue because you set the rules of engagement or the client team set the rules of engagement for procurement at the outset. I think what more careful thought needs to be into of what those rules of engagement are in terms of the issues that the coal report or inquiry has risen. I mean, clearly the, uh, the particular PPP contracts are quite complex and uh, the companies have top lawyers that put these together and negotiate them. How good are councils at matching their skills in terms of perhaps getting the right lawyers to actually back them up in the negotiation process? I think every local authority would be different. For Edinburgh, we've got a framework with all the major firms in Edinburgh. So something as complicated as that, we would bring in uh, external expertise to advise. I think the industry is learning from past mistakes on PPP contracts that were entered into um, you know, 15 years ago. It's still evolving in terms of the issues that have arisen. Um, for example, the NHS, um, the, the Royal Infirmary in, in Edinburgh. Um, you know, you would sign up to some contracts today that were entered into 15 years ago because of what has been learnt in that intervening period in relation to uh, the PPP model. But of course, these contracts that were entered into 15 years ago have still got another 15 years or so to run. Exactly. Mm. When the contract's actually signed, is there any risk assessment on it? Is there any process of risk assessment on that contract to, to, to manage any uh, issues that might come out from it or potentially come out from it? I think in terms of the negotiation, some of these contracts take a year to negotiate. Mm -hmm. So through that whole process, you're constantly looking at the risks. Now in commercial negotiation, it's about in some cases, compromising on some things and not compromising on, the, uh, on others. And that's the cut and thrust of a skilled negotiator to be able to ensure that they're getting the best for effectively the client, which is the council. But there would still be areas where there was, uh, I won't say weakness, but uh, where, the, where the risk is higher than in other aspects of the contract, so that the council presumably would want to keep keep managing that risk and ensure that it was mitigated where possible. Absolutely, but in each and every circumstances you have to look at the respective negotiating strength of each party. So if I had a contract that was extremely valuable and I'm negotiating with three parties about who gets that contract, my negotiating position has improved considerably as opposed to a one-to-one. -one. So the competition between the parties trying to get that contract allows the local authority to be able to come out with a better outcome because you're in a better negotiating position. Can, can I ask then, if the local authority is a place that's in the best position, how they ended up getting a deal that didn't involve the safety of the schools at the heart of it? I am absolutely 100% prepared to admit that, that at that time the council got it wrong. Yeah, but I mean, that's not getting it wrong, that's fundamentally missing the whole point of what you were there to do. That's not, you know, that's not making a mistake, that's making an absolute huge error of incredible proportions. I'm not sure if there's a question there, but no, I, agree. I think I think it was made as a statement and don't feel that you have to try and respond can, to it. Sorry, Colin. Can I ask still on this in this question, just to tie this one bit up? Um, Reference has been made that uh, the contractors have been making good some of the, uh, the uh, deficiencies. Is that uniform, that, all the, that in every case the contractors are picking up the cost? I can only speak for Edinburgh, but yes, this answered our question. Is that, is that the same for... Yeah, but I mean, I, I, I 
Yeah, it is in terms of the PPP arrangements that would be part of the, the normal maintenance. So leaving the risk aside, the cost at least isn't coming to the public purse? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. There will be other costs, of course. Um, does this mean, I mean, we keep talking about errors, but the pattern shows that it's happening across the country and that, de that deficiencies have been picked up quite extensively. Is it not that we're seeing a deliberate attempt by contractors to cut corners, cut costs, to try and come in within budget? Is that, is that what we're looking at? I think the era at that time was, it was a new concept. It was moved away from traditional onto design and build. Contractors would appear to have had a free reign, rightly or wrongly. And there was probably far too much work on. There was harsh penalties for failing to complete on time. And because of that, that impacted inequality. And that's the reason we've seen it. But we keep talking about, we, we, we keep trying to put nice words around it. But the fact is, oh, it was horrendous. corners were cut. Oh, absolutely. There's, there's just no doubt about that. Whether Deliberately? It would appear so, yes. You can't really ask them to, to start throwing accusations at them. But you've got to look the here and now. The evidence would suggest the here and now. We, we have now researched and analysed our more recent projects, and we have not found that level of defect. It would tend to suggest that the industry has matured, the sector has matured, and we're not in that same situation. We certainly don't want to be there ever again. All of us sitting here, we're not instrumental in procuring these projects. We are instrumental in making sure we remedy the defects that's happened before us. OK, thanks, Colin. Uh, sorry, Bright. OK, Mr Lowe, very briefly. It was just to quickly back up. I, mean, I agree with what Alan's saying there as well, and I would just back up the point. There is an element where just volumes of work at particular points in time, and I think at that point in time there was a huge volume of work um, going on across the country as well, which puts added pressures on the, you know, contractors in terms of speed and, and, and getting things moving, which I think can be a contributory factor. OK, thank you. John? Yeah, thank you. One of the, the issues that's been reflected earlier, so you know, obviously not spend a lot of time on it now, but this question of whether there's an issue about a gap in skills and training both within the local authorities, but also within the construction industry. So this was the first question is, has there been a change in policy within local authorities around capacity issues? I mean, back in the day, you would have had an architect's department, a fully staffed planning department. You would have capacity at that level to be able to monitor projects. Am I right in thinking that that capacity is diminished? And was that part of being at the difficulty in supervising these projects? And if so, what's the local authorities done about that? I'll just, I'll just clarify from a, again from a South Lancashire Council perspective that, that we have a, a, a team of around 100 uh, multidisciplinary officers, architects, engineers, quantity surveyors, structural engineers, and the, and the like. So, in terms of that team, um, that that is there to deliver the programme. It's, it's tend to be a team that's been in place over a number of years and has built up a fair degree of knowledge and experience um, of managing projects and, and delivering um, the kind of fairly successful projects. I do so say myself um, in, in terms of our school estate. Um, so, from our perspective, then that is something that's not been the case. That that staffing level has has remained consistently high. We routinely check um, year on year uh, in terms of workforce planning what works are coming ahead for us. We look at volumes of work. We look at types of work that are going to be coming as well, and we then cross reference that with the team that's in place to make sure that have we got the right skills match or not, and then we would adjust a team accordingly. And in some cases, then we would take the view that potentially we may not wish to add to the team because you know that's a, a constant level we want to keep at. But then it's important that there are external frameworks with consultancies or whatever else as well that we can go and we can engage with um, in order to bring in staff or uh, consultants on a, a short term or on a project project um, where either potentially we don't have the skills or expertise inside to deliver that, or alternatively. Um, you know, where we just don't have the capacity at that point in time. And is that different in other places? Yeah. Uh, it's identical in, in Edinburgh. There was a time, um, coincidentally, in around the time of PPP1, where there was a view that all disciplines should be outsourced and there should be no in-house team. 
but today with around 100 architects, engineers, clerical works, etc., who are all delivering projects directly in-house in terms of design right through to uh, construction. But we've also got frameworks um, in respect of delivery of major projects or to draw down when work volume uh, goes up. It's similar in Aberdeenshire, we, we've around about 100 uh, internal resources. We use external resources, probably £2 million a year in external resources. I've always had good support with the office and political leadership to, to resource. They, they, they've recognised it's a big programme that needs to be resourced efficiently, so um, we're okay in that regard. It is harder to attract staff, that's what I'd say. I've never been the full complement, and that's across it. And it's, it fluctuates. Sometimes it's the state surveyors, sometimes it's engineers, sometimes it's building surveyors. It's, it's hard to attract to get the full complement of staff. So to be clear, the lack of supervision of these projects wasn't about the capacity of the councils to do it, but it was an act of choice that it was somebody yes. else's job. On the question of the skills um, base amongst the construction industry, I mean, I'm rather troubled <coughs> by the idea that left its own devices, or to their own devices, contractors basically try to cut corners are rather reckless and I mean there's a picture that's emerging, reckless in terms of safety, and that at an operative level, at the basic level of the, the workforce, they're unaware that they're doing the wrong things because of the lack of training. Is that an unfair characterization of what's happened? Uh, I think what we're suffering from now in lack of skill set is a result of the recession in that at that time um, people leaving school to get into a profession during a recession were not going to get into a trade that was basically a ground to a halt. However, um, the, the difficulty, is, as Alan's alluded to, for local authorities has been able to match in, in a buoyant market to match the salaries that are available in the private sector, and that is always a restraint. Mm -hmm. What Edinburgh has tried to do in every single procurement contract relating to construction, there is an obligation for, as part of the tender, for apprentices to be taken on by, from the local community of where the asset is being built. And that is an absolute obligation on the successful party that is, uh, now it might be woodwork, it might be brick laying, or whatever, but there is an obligation uh, in terms of uh, yeah, and it's scored as actually as part of the procurement process. Mm. And, and these initiatives have happened in different places, different times, and they're to be welcomed. But I'm just wondering, is there something about the construction industry itself? Trade unions within the construction industry often talk about um, the subcontracting out to the point where there's not proper supervision. The level of health and safety in Scotland in the construction trade industry is still a scandal. The level of fatalities we know is still a concern. But what you seem to be saying is that left its own de to their own devices, the contractors will cut corners. Now, if they're cutting corners in terms of the safety of the buildings they then complete, presumably there are safety issues for those construction workers that are working within the industry. How do, you, how do we address that broader question? Because it may be that in the procurement issues that you've seen, the flaws emerge, or in some places they're avoided because there's good supervision. But in the private sector, where buildings have been constructed within the private sector and there is nobody supervising in terms of public interest, is there a major problem there in terms of safety? My general impression in, in safety, is, safety has improved considerably over the years. And we take it very seriously in Aberdeenshire. We've got two full-time safety officers within our team. And the, the construction skills cards, you won't go on a site without it. And the induction processes you need to adopt before you go on site. From, and that's from my perception. But I'm not on sites every day. But that's so, as a generalisation. That's been my... So it may be that there are, there's greater safety on the site. However, the capacity of individuals who are working on the site to either be aware of or flag up that their corners has been cut didn't seem to be working. I mean, if you imagine you're a young person working in a site, building a school, you either don't know that you're not doing the right thing, or you do know, but there's nobody that you can speak to about it. Either way, we would suggest there's a skills, a lack of skills to know there's a problem, or the lack of a space for them to go and tell anybody about it. Because this picture that you're creating, that's basically, if you don't watch these people at Hawks, they'll just 
they'll just build things that are unsafe. Now, I'm sure the contractors would be interested to hear from them, their view on that characterisation, but they would also, from the point of view of the, the person who's doing the job with autonomy, with a trade, who would identify there was a problem what they've been asked to do or not been asked to do, is there an issue about where they're able to go? So it's either they don't know they're not doing the right thing, or they do know, but there isn't a place for them to, to raise that. Sorry, possibly even a third part that they do go and raise it, but it's still somebody makes a choice not to do anything about it, which, which I think is potentially the third element to that. Um, I, I think it is a difficult one, and as we kind of spoke about earlier, that you know, is it just a case of engaging more and more checkers to go and sit and top everybody all the way through a project to make sure they, they do things, or is it that bit that, again, effectively, if, if people have got a role and they understand their role and they, they know what they've got to do, then it's just it's incumbent upon them that they do it. And I think that goes back to potentially going back to the contracting organisations as well in terms of the responsibility and that kind of top-down attitude as well and cascading that down, the same as we would do for health and safety and the like as well and say things are unacceptable. There is that bit that it's almost a, 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 you know, possibly even a change um, in some respects of culture. Um, that you know, Time's important in a job, costs in important in a job as well, but um, time and cost shouldn't be at the sacrifice of quality. So the quality uh, you know, needs to be to be made sure and, and trying to develop and deliver projects that are error free as best as possible. So I think it's that bit that, that people need to be comforted that if they are going with an issue or they are raising an issue, then there is that commitment you know, from the top down in a company that that will get sorted. Do you have a view at all on, on some suggestion from last week that in the dilution of apprenticeships in the construction industry? Because, you know, the, the old trades, if you think the old craft, you would just say the people would have a sense of their own responsibility and would say, well, no, actually, I can't deliver this in the way that you're suggesting. But if it's broken down and diluted, people are doing their own wee bit and they're not necessarily seeing how the different things are coming together. Um. Yeah, from a building standards point of view, what sort of feedback we get from surveyors who, who go out and, uh, on site is that the, the traditional structure of a construction company now is completely changed from what it was 10, 15 years ago. Um, you know, you had your, your apprentice, you had your charge hand, you had your foreman, and you almost had these the, uh, an inbuilt sort of quality system, if you like, that was taken taken for granted. Um, that's now gone under the, you know, the, the a sort of modern structure where a lot of the, the uh, things, um, you know, subcontracted out. So yep. there's been a significant so change there. Would you concur with the view very often expressed by the construction unions that there's an issue about subcontracting out so far, or what they also style the bogus self-employed? That in fact you can have a construction company which is really tiny and all the work is, is subbed out and there are a consequence for quality in relation to that? I think there needs to be, you know, whatever the structure is of the company or, or the contract, there has to be procedures in place to ensure that the, the operatives are, are competent. Okay, thank you. And, and is, there, is, there, is there procedures in place to make sure that the people working on sites are competent? I, I, I do believe cert, certain sectors have, have uh, uh, competency levels in place. Okay. Certain sectors. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us to the end of this evidence session. Uh, and can I thank you very much for your, for your attendance and your and your evidence. Next week, in the last evidence session and inquiry, the committee will hear from the Minister for Local Government and Housing and the Scottish Futures Trust. That brings us to the end of the public part of the meeting, and I will wait for the gallery to clear. Thanks again. <laughs>